say you were doing just a regular cognitive psychology experiment. Uh, how would it go? Well, you would probably start by defining what is the, the mental process, the cognitive process you're interested in. Um, and let's just say that I'm interested into semantic processing. Okay. So then the next thing to do is to define some kind of task that can allow us to tap into the process we care about. So I will say that we will have participants read uh, sentences. Okay, we'll present sentences one at a time and we'll have them read them. Um, and maybe half of the sentences are just sort of straightforward sentences. The other half maybe contain some kind of ambiguity, something where it's not exactly clear what somebody is saying because some word in there might have multiple meanings. Take the word, uh, take the sentence, uh, they were throwing stones at the bank. Okay, and, and you, and there's ambiguity as to whether what's happening is that somebody's upset at Bank of America or they are in a, by a wonderful river and they're throwing stones towards the bank of the river. Okay, so conditions, uh, some sentences are just sort of easy to interpret. Others require greater effort um, for semantic processing. Now, what we might do is uh, we might then measure some kind of behavioral response, maybe response time, how long it takes to a participant to respond to a question about the sentence they just read, or how accurately can they respond to that. And then we would compare how accurately or, or quickly somebody can respond to, question, to sentences or questions about sentences in condition A, so sentences that had no ambiguity to them, versus sentences in condition B, sentences that did have some kind of ambiguity to them, right? So this is sort of a fairly boring in the sense I didn't elaborate much on what the experiment would be, but this, is, this would be one way of thinking about how to create a cognitive psychology experiment. Now, if you just replace behavioral response, be it response time being some kind of accuracy measure, if you just replace that with bold fMRI data, then you have yourself a cognitive neuroscience experiment. The logic is exactly the same. You find some mental process of interest, semantic processing. Uh, you define a task that can manip manipulate that. In our case, reading sentences. And then you measure bold while somebody reads sentences. And then you compare the bold response to sentences in condition A, so the bold response when there was no ambiguity, to the bold response to sentences in condition B when there was ambiguity. You compare the two and lo and behold, you find that there's some part of the brain that is specifically um, responsive to sentences that contain ambiguity. Okay, so this would be sort of the logic behind a, a vanilla cognitive neuroscience experiment. Now, when you set up uh, fMRI experiments, uh, and in fact, any other type of experimental uh, approach, um, there are at least two different levels of experimental design that are relevant. And the first one is the so-called conceptual design. Now, this is pretty general um, to any experimental approach. Um, and the type of questions you're asking here is, what is the process of interest? And how can you create the task, or rather, what is a task that will allow me to tap into the process of interest? So this would be um, like trying to find the, 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 an, an appropriate task to address the cognitive process that I care about. And, and the issues here, as I, were say, as I was saying, are pretty much the same issues that you encounter in creating and designing a cognitive psychology a cognitive psychology experiment. Now, a second aspect, um, which I will refer to as a methodological design aspect. Now, this is about how can we turn my cognitive question of interest, so how does semantic processing work, into and, and whatever task allows me to elicit that type of process. How can I turn that into a, into a design that is amenable 
to the FM, to the constraints of fMRI. So the issues that we encounter here are specific to the method that we use, in our case, fMRI. If we were doing electroencephalography, EEG, or magnetoencephal magnetoencephalography, MEG, or some other form of imaging, we would have probably slightly different types of constraints. Let me give you an example. As I was saying earlier, in terms of conceptual design issues, uh, you know, one example, as I said, is selecting an appropriate task and an appropriate design that can allow us to address whatever is the cognitive process we care about. Just to give you a couple of quick examples, just to explain what I'm talking about, maybe you care about working memory, or maybe that's the, the, the cognitive process that you're interested in studying. So who knows, you might create a task where somebody has to maintain some sort of information in mind and perhaps manipulate it and you know, rearrange it in some way. Right? Or maybe you're interested in mental rotation. And so you might have to, you might present two figures to somebody and ask them to verify whether the two figures are the same object just rotated or if they're different objects. And maybe you care about semantic memory. So you might um, give somebody a noun and ask them generate an appropriate verb for this noun something of that sort. So these are conceptual issues that relate to what are we interested in and how could we get to it. And as I was saying, these issues are pretty much the same whether you're doing fMRI or whether you're doing a behavioral uh, experiment or whether you're doing an EEG experiment or a PET experiment and so on. Now in this class, we will focus more on the second type um, of design issues Now, the central aspect of uh, fMRI methodology, which was also true of other methodologies, such as the positron emission tomography, which is what you're seeing in this uh, figure, um, one of the central aspects of how we do fMRI experiments is that we use the so-called subtraction method, also known as a cognitive subtraction method. Now, the idea is that in order to find what part of the brain is specifically important for one given cognitive process of interest, what we do is we compare bold activation during two different tasks that, there are, that are identical, except one of the two has this one additional process I care about and the other one doesn't have it. So if I subtract, let's say that my task of interest, reading sentences that have ambiguity, semantic ambiguity to it, versus reading sentences that don't have any semantic ambiguity to it, uh, to them. So if I look at the bold activations during the semantically ambiguous sentences and I subtract out the activation from reading sentences that don't have anything ambiguous to them, ideally, I should be left only with what is important for processing semantic ambiguity. And this is known as the pure insertion hypothesis, which I will discuss in just a moment in greater depth. So the idea is that we measure bold response under two different conditions, and then we subtract one from the other, as you're seeing in the top row of this, six, of, uh, this illustration. So here's you know, condition A right here, um, condition B, and you subtract the two when you're left only with where they differ. And the idea is that wherever you see activation in the difference map, this is where the, whatever cognitive process is differing between these two, this is the part of the brain that is particularly interested in it. Right? So regions of difference between the two tasks, we interpret them as reflecting whatever is the cognitive process that differed between our two tasks. And then you would repeat the process for a number of participants. So as you see here, this, you do the difference between condi your condition of interest and some baseline or control condition. You get a difference for participant one and you store it right there. Then you take participant two, you take the difference between their task of interest and their control task you take at their difference and you store it. You do the same process for subjects three, four, and five. 
And then you can average the differences from each of the subjects and create one group map. So the average of the difference between the two tasks across all five of your participants. 